You are here for a reason. God wasn't playing a dice when He picked you. You were chosen. He chose you to declare His glory, to proclaim the gospel, to save the lost, to reveal His authority and disciple the nations. Now is the time to live your life with a purpose. Take your stand, because this battle is not going to be easy. Prepare yourself for the battle. Be equipped, carry your weapon, and wear your full armor. Listen, for the Lord will speak to you. He will show us His immeasurable glory. The long wait is over. Now is the time. The Lord has spoken. From this day on, I will bless you. Good morning, Grace Walk Church. How's everybody today? Uh, I'm excited to be having our first in church service in quite some time, in several weeks, in almost over a month, I think. And uh, it's good to be here. You notice I'm wearing a mask. I'm going to explain that to you in just a minute. Um, we've asked our worship team to wear a mask. We've asked anybody that comes to church to wear a mask, and that's for a reason. A number of years ago, in 1975, I had the privilege and honor of being accepted into the Air Force ROTC pilot program and went to uh, Mountain Home Air Force Base where I did six weeks of officer training camp. In the course of that six weeks, we were given different responsibilities at different ranks. And there was a time that for three days, we'd have a different level. Like you might be a major, you might be a lieutenant, might be a captain, you could be a general, it could be any number of those things. But anyway, we were flying from Mountain Home Air Force Base, which is in Idaho, down to Texas, and there we were going to get some flight training in a T-37 uh, trainer jet. So we loaded, we would load up on a C-141 and we would take our whole cadet class over there, which was several hundred. And I, at that time, I was made a colonel. So we had a staff meeting prior to the departure the day uh, before in the evening. And a decision was given to me by the people that were training us, and that was, you're the colonel, there is a chance it's gonna rain in Texas, and so if it does rain in Texas, you're going to have to uh, have everybody wear a raincoat. And now you don't have to have them take a raincoat, but if it rains and they don't have their raincoat, it will be a major uh, tick against your shown as leadership. However, if they take a raincoat, everyone will have to carry their raincoat on their right arm, folded over, and they have to walk everywhere they go with that raincoat, which was kind of a heavy uh, plastic material. Immediately, people that were in the staff meeting afterwards says, Joe, don't, don't make us take the raincoat, please. It's hot down in Texas. Don't make us take the raincoat. And I had so much pressure not to take the raincoat. But ultimately, I decided to take the raincoat simply because if, as a leader, we get down there and there is rain, I should have the troops prepared. Needlessly to say it didn't rain, but three days later, everybody forgot about it and they were moving on to their next thing. So the decision to mask up at church was not an easy one for me. I don't like wearing masks. I don't like the way it makes me feel. I don't like the way it makes me look. I just don't like wearing masks. However, it came out this last Tuesday, a research big study by some of the top scientists in the world found out after a, an extensive study that if you wore a mask and everybody wore a mask in the same place that this disease, the COVID-19, the spread of the disease was reduced by 75%. Now, that's a lot. 
They also found that if we had all masked up at the beginning of the quarantine, when they first said, we don't want you in groups of larger than 10 people, we probably would be beyond this whole epidemic. And there's a good chance that we would have got a good handle on it and been able to restart our economy up. So, there has been, to date, three churches that I know of, one in California, one in Texas, one in Georgia, that have opened up prior to us, where they didn't wear masks, and the disease was spread through the worship team, or the choir, or people's breath, and an outbreak happened there, and those churches have been forced to shut down. I don't want to force this church, I don't want us to be forced to shut down. Not only that, but we have had, been hit hard with COVID-19 in our church family. Here is a picture of Pedro uh, Rea. His funeral was yesterday. This is his family members. All of his kids here that are in this picture have attended Grace Walk or in the past or currently attend Grace Walk. And uh, they lost their dear dad and lots of kids lost their grandpa. And... Uh, it was a tragic loss to them. He died of COVID-19. Since then, we have another uh, regular attender in our church, one of our church leaders, whose uncle has now passed away from COVID. He's age 17. And then we have Barbara Nunez, our office manager. Uh, she learned this week that her cousin, age 56, has passed away from COVID. There's a total of 20 people then that have been affected directly within our church, or indirectly family members uh, that have been affected with this virus. It has affected a number of families in our church and seems to spread quite rapidly once it comes into a family, especially those that live in smaller dwellings, apartment complexes and smaller homes. It spreads quite rapidly. It doesn't seem, we know that it affects the elderly or they're more vulnerable to death, however, We've had more young people within our church family get this than we have old people. And we've had uh, the youngest being two months old and then a five-year-old and then a couple of 14-year-olds and a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, a um, 22-year-old, a couple of 33-year-olds, several 40-year-olds, and two or three 60-year-old people have contacted this virus within our church family. So all of this happened prior to us opening. This disease is very real. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that are saying a lot of different stuff about this, but this disease is very, very, very real. So you can see in this video up here, wearing a surgical mask can reduce Coronavirus transmission by up to 75%, study says. That was reported on Fox News uh, this last Wednesday. And then another thing, I want to explain why you wear a mask. You don't wear a mask to protect yourself. These masks do not protect you. You would have to be in full um, biohazard gear with your whole face covered, your eyes covered in goggles, a uh, mask that sucks up in a, a biohazard suit to be completely protected just like they work on the COVID um, uh, wards. Now, why should you wear a mask? And you can see it in this illustration right here. Let's look at that. It's called the urine test. If someone, if we were all to run around naked and someone pees on you, you get wet right away. If you are wearing pants and someone pees, you will get, it, will go, it, it may go through your pants, but not as much, so you are better protected. If the guy who pees also is wearing pants, the pee stays with him and you don't get wet. I don't want to get wet. And uh, I know you don't want to get wet. I was talking to one of our nurses who is working in one of the larger hospitals here and is right there with the, the patients. And this week she told me, Pastor, make everybody wear a mask. We're seeing this thing first up. One of the doctors I work with has now passed away of COVID. Another doctor I work with has now been hospitalized with COVID. She says, we've seen more people put on ventilators this week 
and more people on the, the ward this week than we have, uh, or in these last two weeks than we have in the two previous months. This last Tuesday, we hit an all-time record globally of new infections around the world. This, this virus is spreading globally. If you want to look at current facts on it, you can go to worldometer.com. It'll give you up-to-date information of what it is doing in your state, what is it doing in different countries, what it's doing in the United States. And so as of this Sunday, we have tied the record of number of people to die since the worst pandemic since 1918, and that was in 1968. This is a very serious and a real, very real virus. And we need to understand and realize that this is not some ploy of the government. This is not conspiracy to, you know, of the elite, or I hear all these different, um, people send me all these kind of different things about conspiracy. I don't believe single one of those is true. I, I believe that in time you will know they're not true as you begin to see how this disease spread. This is no different than the 1918 pandemic. I read the book, The 1918 Pandemic, which is a historical book, and it was written in 2018, and, and it was historical facts. And in that book, you see how these viruses spread and how bad they are. Now, another reason we decided to mask up because there are some unscrupulous attorneys and law firms that are now beginning to sue everybody who has anybody get sick in their place of business, and now they're even trying to sue nonprofits. And uh, uh, here's an article that came out this week. It says, tidal wave of COVID-19 lawsuits on the way, April 21st, 2020. And it goes on to say, as the new normal sinks in with social distancing and government-imposed shutdowns, some businesses are struggling to stay afloat. Now many are about to be slammed with a tidal wave of litigation as consumers and injured parties seek compensation for COVID-related losses. Industries like airlines are being sued. The cruise, all the cruise lines have lawsuits again. Walmart, McDonald's, it goes on. Uh, Starbucks, it goes on and on and on. They're filing these lawsuits. They're even running uh, TV ads now looking for people to call in. They might be qualified. So with all that said, it is important that the church remain relevant in this time. The devil wants to shut down the church. So we're gonna take these precautions and if I have to preach with a mask on till it's not so bad, I will preach with a mask on. If worship people have to sing with a mask on, we will do that. We will do whatever we need to do because right now it's more important than ever that the church stay alive because people need us. We're having more cases Matter of fact, I just read an article by Psychology Today that said psychologists are seeing a tsunami. They're warning of a tsunami of mental health issues and breakdowns people mentally. We're seeing calls come in for marriage crisis and marriage problems and, and people just struggling with the, the quarantine and the working conditions and things of that nature. Many people are afraid. This is affecting people. And the church needs to be there during this time of crisis. We don't need to be retreating, but we need to be actively praying. We're called to work in the spiritual realm just like those People, those heroes that work in Fry's and Walmart and the grocery stores and the hospitals and the EMT operators and all the firemen and police officers, we are essential. The governor of Ducey has declared churches essential and he's uh, given us a blessing to be open and ministering, but he's also asked us to follow certain guidelines. And so we're trying to follow those guidelines to the best of our ability. And one of those, they suggest everybody wear a mask who comes to church and everybody have their temperature checked. So we're following these guidelines because we want to stay safe. We want you to be safe. We don't want to be a spreading of this disease and we sure don't want this break breaking out, so uh, we want to get people saved during this time, we want to get people healed during this time, and we, by the way, we have seen several of these COVID patients miraculously healed, I can share those testimonies, I'll just share one of them with you as the two-year-old child, 
I kind of talked about this last week, but uh, our two-month-old child uh, was admitted into the hospital and uh, with a full-blown COVID, had it, uh, the blood test, had the oxygen test, had the, the swipe, uh, uh, had the x-rays, had the COVID pneumonia. Uh, the child was struggling to live. Uh, they, the parents were frightened. It, it was a terrible, terrible time. And uh, a mom had it, dad had it. Later on, the other three kids, five years old, 14-year-old and a 17-year-old would also get the COVID. It's a very difficult time for this family. Uh, we call them up at the hospital. We begin to pray. And within one hour, that baby's temperature went down. The fever broke. The oxygen levels came up. And when they re-X-rayed, there was no evidence whatsoever of the COVID being in that body. I have good news. I was just talking with the parents the other day, uh, just recently, and they're all starting to feel better. They're all starting to get better. They're all starting to get well. The baby hasn't been sick that so came home from the hospital. Let's give God the praise, but that's why it's important for us to be the church. It is so important for us to rise up and be the church during this hour and during this time. So we're opening up and limiting seating, you know, to, uh, to keep that distancing as we guidelines we've been issued by the uh, Arizona Health Department and they're following the CDC's uh, guidelines. But this virus, I want to tell you, is a very real thing. It's no different than the Spanish influenza of 1918. Um, this is going to take some time. We were notified this week by uh, health officials around the world, the World Health Organization and others, that this pandemic is probably going to be with us for a long, long time. I read an article today, or uh, just yesterday, I read an article where it said, that to reach herd immunity, this may take three to four years. It could be 2023 to 2024. So we can't sideline, and our economy can't sideline. And if it requires us to wear masks to get our economy back up, we got to get our economy back up because that will cause as much problems as anything. April 27th, our unemployment rate was 14.7. They're estimating now it's as high as 19 percent, 19.7 percent. That is horrible. That's the worst since the Great Depression. They're calling this a depression right now. We have to start this economy up. As you know, during the Great Depression, there became two million people that were homeless, and that was a population of 127 million. We now have 330 million. We'll have millions of people that will become homeless. So we got to start the economy. We got to get back to work. And if you need to wear a mask to keep from spreading this, let's wear a mask. Because you can have this disease and not even know you had it. This dad... Uh, that brought it home to his little two-month-old two baby and his rest of his family had no idea he was even carrying the disease. And it wasn't until people started getting sick that they realized. And so this is why we do these kind of things. And so we, we need to be praying for our nation. We need to believe God. But living in a, a denial is, is not faith. Faith is where we stand up and we proclaim where we're gonna go but it doesn't mean that we don't see where we're at right now. So right now, the world is in trouble. This is spread to all 195 countries of this world. It's spreading like wildfire in Russia. It's spreading like wildfire in Brazil. It's spreading like wildfire uh, throughout Africa and regions of, of Africa that, where I used to live. And so this thing is spreading rapidly. It's sparking back up in other parts of the country where, or the world where they got it settled down. And by the way, the countries like China and South Korea and, and Italy and Spain where they brought this thing down and even France, they were required, everybody had to wear a mask. I was watching a program about masks and you can't walk around New York City without a mask on. This is kind of mandatory, but it's, it's not because they want to take away your freedom. It's because... If we all wear masks, the inf uh, infection rate goes down 75%. That's enough of the speech about the COVID-19. And I want to move on to my real message about the prayer of Jabez, a prayer of more, out of 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. Let me read that passage. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 through 10 says, Jabez was more honorable, and that's what the word I want to concentrate, is that word honorable in the Hebrew, it's kabod. 
Uh, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Now, the word Jabez literally means pain. Uh, Jabez cried out to God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Now, I want to concentrate on that passage. First off, how would you like it if your mom named you pain? Another translation is grief. In other words, you're nothing but a pain to me. My life has turned badly because you've been born. Child, you, you brought nothing but pain into my life, and so I'm going to call you pain because every time I look at you, I'm going to think how you cause pain into my life by you coming into this world. As Jabez grew up, knowing what his name meant, and back in Bible times, you named people prophetically based upon where you wanted to see that person go. So you named them usually something to do with God and something of that nature. But here, like for instance, the name Joseph, uh, Yosef in Hebrew, my name, it means he shall add or bring increase. God will bring increase into my life. I'm going to bring increase to other people's life. But his name was called Jabez. And he cried out to God when he became a man. And he says, oh, that you would bless me. Because he wasn't blessed prior to that. And enlarge my territory and let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so I will be free from pain or from Jabez. And God granted his request because it says he was more honorable than his brothers. And that's where we want to concentrate on that word honor, that word kabod. So many of our problems we face today is the result of lack of integrity or honor. That word integrity is another word that speaks of honor. So for instance, when you drive across a bridge, you want that bridge to have integrity because if it doesn't have integrity, it could collapse and kill you. So that's why we, we check on the structure of the bridge and so forth and so on to make sure the integrity is in that bridge. So forth with aircraft. We want to make sure they have these annual inspections. They have an inspection every 100 hours to make sure that the integrity of that aircraft is still there, that it's not a wing's not going to fall off or something like that. And so 1 Chronicles chapter 4, 9 through 10 is about a man whose life is full of pain but yet, in spite of the difficulties of his life, he chose to be more honorable or more trustworthy or more honest than people around him. And God noticed that. So the word here, uh, like I said before, it, it's kabod, and it also is the very word that's used to describe God. When God talks about himself, when God uh, is talked about, that word kabod is translated glory or the heaviness of God. I want to look at this word in Strong's uh, 3513. That's where you can find it in the Strong's Concordance for all you Bible students. And it's pronounced it kabod, uh, to be heavy. Have, have you ever said, heard that phrase, man, you're really heavy. That, that, it's kind of the same meaning, like, man, you got substance. Man, you're, you're weighty. Like, you, 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 you have authority. You're like, uh, man, that guy really walks in with a heaviness. So it can be in a good sense. It can be in bad sense. Um, for instance, in a bad sense, it, it means you're burdensome, you're severe, you're dull. Uh, like, God, that guy, he was so heavy. It's just like the whole joy just left the place. And, uh, or, in a good sense, it means you're numerous or rich. Um, gold is called kabod, meaning that it's weighty, it's, 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 it's substance. Uh, it also can be described as honorable. And what's really interesting about this word, and I found this very interesting, is uh, in, in the same two sense, uh, senses, abounding with more grievous aff uh, afflict. In, in other words, if, if God comes on the scene, he's heavy. He's gonna, it, it's like he's going to cause things to happen. He's going to afflict the situation. But if the devil comes on the situation, he's also heavy, not as heavy as God, but he's also going to afflict, afflict it in a, a bad sense. So this coronavirus is a heavy thing. 
It's a heavy thing all of us are dealing with, but our God is a mighty God. He's a heavier God than this kind of thing. So we under, need to understand that through the power of God, people can get killed and we can overcome this thing. So it goes on, uh, a glorious or, or honor. So he was more honorable. Uh, Jabez was more honorable than the people he grew up around, his neighbors, his and maybe he had siblings, we don't really know. But regardless of the people he grew up with, God, in God's eyes, said he was more honorable. So there's two verses in the whole Bible that talk about Jabez. These are the only two verses. Never again is he mentioned, never before is he mentioned. But what we see here, that when he prayed to God, and he said, God, turn my grief, turn my life that's been full of heavy pain into heavy goodness. Turn my life that's been full of difficulties into prosperity. And God says, I will do that because you are like me. You are weighty. You are heavy. You are glorious in a good sense. You are honorable. You have honor. You know, we hear this word again in the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments. It says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long on the land which Jehovah, your God, gives you. So... If you honor your mom and dad, God will increase your life. It's a promise. It's the, it's the one of the Ten Commandments that is the, the one that comes with a promise. So the promise is if I show respect, if I see them as weighty, as an authority, as I see them with value, as I respect them, then God sees that and he blesses me. And that's how we need to see God also, by the way. Now, God grants favor to the honorable. Uh, Jabez means grief or burden, but Jabez prayed, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory there your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, keep me from evil, stop us, stop me from doing what's wrong and bad, that I may not cause pain in my life. And I believe, you know, a lot of times, I'm thinking about Jabez, his mother didn't want him. She probably just left him as an orphan. He probably grew up with somebody else, probably went through a very difficult life. Um, But in spite of all that, he decided, I'm not gonna do evil. I'm not gonna repay the pain that's been brought into my life upon somebody else. But I I wanna be delivered from this and I wanna come to the place that I never caused pain and that evil's delivered from me. I, I pray this prayer upon my life. I pray, oh God, I pray that I'll be more honorable than those around me. I pray I will have, be a person of honesty, integrity, trustworthiness, and that I will be solid, that I'll have a good influence, influence on people. And this is one of the things that puzzles me is people watch these videos of these conspiracy people. They don't even know who these people are. There's no vetting of their credentials. They just assume they, what they're saying must be true. Those people aren't credible. You don't know them, but I hope I am. And, and I'm, I hope you understand that, that our government for the most part, is good. Yes, I know a lot of us are afraid of our government. I know a lot of us disagree with parts of our government, and and that's a good thing, but we have freedom in America, and overall, I'm very grateful to the country I live in, and uh, I thank God for those who serve in in our country. But it goes on to, uh, I want you to see this other point, because Jabez was more honorable than his brother. God granted him favor. So it was that integrity and honesty and trustworthiness. Now, also when we're more honorable, we gain favor or influence with people. See, if you're at your job and they can trust you, they don't believe you're stealing from them, so forth and so on, they will uh, promote you and you'll go places. You know, a number of years ago when I was a young man, just got saved, I was working in a, a stone yard where they made flagstone and, and, and I've already told, many of you have heard about my stories in the rock quarry and uh, this was actually a yard where we, uh, we took flagstone and we, we cut it and so forth and so on. And one day I got promoted to the very top of that yard of all the people, some people have worked there for 11 years and promoted above them. 
And the owner, uh, Mr. Dunbar, he took me aside and says, you know why I promoted you? He says, because I've been watching, hiding. I've been hiding where nobody can see me. And I've been watching how everybody works. And when you cut stone, you're cutting more than two men. And when you unload the stone off the semis, you're unloading three pieces of flagstone to the northern men's one. And he says, because of that, I promoted you over this whole yard. And then I got a raise to another yard, and I got, he offered me more money to stay there in another yard back and forth, and, and that's how I ended up in the rock quarry, is uh, they offered me more money, but it was because I was trustworthy. And so many employees aren't trustworthy. Uh, my wife, Tammy, was sharing with me about a thing she saw on TV just recently where they did hidden cameras in doctor's offices, and they found that over 80% of the people who were sitting in the waiting room of a doctor's office looked in the drawers of the cabinet. Now, I can honestly say I don't recall ever looking in the drawers when I sat in the doctor's office. I was just in the doctor's office the other day. And uh, I sat in there by myself for quite a long time. You know how long you wait. And I was thinking about what she said. And I thought, you know... I wouldn't mo no more walk over there and look in there because I don't belong in there. And see, that's what integrity is. That's what his honor is. People can trust you. And so here's some, some things I want to look at. Uh, the reason we find favor and influence is discovered in the definition of the word kabod or honorable. It's right in that definition is that we are trustworthy. It's kind of like that bridge. We drive our car over those bridges without even thinking twice about it because we trust the people that built the bridge and the inspectors and, and, so, and the products they put into that. And then the next thing, an honorable person is someone you can depend upon, trustworthy, faithful, integrity, high moral standards, works harder, even works hard even when the boss isn't watching. Even when the boss isn't watching. You work hard. Um, they don't lie. They don't steal. They don't take advantage of others. They don't commit fraud. And they tithe. God says tithe, so they tithe. You know, can God trust you with the tithe? And we wonder how come we're not blessed. See, I'm talking about honor here and what God sees in us. Does God see you as a person of honor? Do people trust you? Can they believe what you say or do you have a history of being caught up in telling stories that weren't true and, and actions that were not right? Well, I got good news for you. We just need to pray, God, keep me from evil. Help me to become a person of integrity. Help me to be like Jay Blaz. Bless me indeed. A large in my territory and, and prosper me and help me not cause pain to anyone else. Now, many think that the only way to get ahead is through dishonorable means. The truth is dishonorable actions will end up releasing, uh, it will not end up releasing us from uh, success, but they'll actually release pain and evil into our lives. When we're dishonest, eventually we're going to get caught. Eventually, when we cheat, and when we lie, and, and when we, we do things we're not supposed to, eventually you're going to get caught and you're going to have to pay the price. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 through 7 says, Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? The godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. And that's another thing. We need to raise our children up the importance of being honest. If your kids see you be dishonest or disrespectful to a police officer, whatever the case may be, then they're going to be, tend to be that way too. And sometimes we wonder how come our kids are having trouble with authority in school and these kind of things. Maybe they've seen us not show respect to these authorities. And so we need to show respect to these people. Proverbs 11.3 says, A good man is guided by his honesty. The evil man is destroyed by his dishonesty. So a good man is guided by his honesty. I want to be guided by doing what is right. And being honest. I don't want to be motivated to do by what is dishonest. And so this is the prayer we need to pray. It's a prayer of Jabez, but it's also a prayer of more. More of God's grace and favor. 
because God answered his prayer due to the integrity or the kabod that was in his life. I want everybody to bow their heads and just close your eyes right now. and Let's get an attitude of prayer. You know, God knows the heart of man. The Bible says he tries our heart and he tests the reins and he knows the very in thoughts and intents of our heart. There's nothing you can hide from God. We are completely exposed. God sees everything. You might fool everybody around you. You might, everybody might think differently of you, but inside you know who you really are. But this is the time we surrender that old man to God and we invite Jesus Christ to come in our heart and make us a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ in a relation, all old things will pass away. Behold, there will become a new creation. So I want you to pray this prayer with me as our heads are down, eyes are closed. If you're not right with God, I want you just right now to acknowledge that by raising your hand up and let God see your hand. All our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. It's just between you and God. Raise it up. God will see your hand. Say, God, I know I need to get right. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ and I want to, get, I want to give my life to Christ. Or maybe you have in the past, but you've drifted away. So just, if you raised your hand, I want you just to pray this prayer after me. Say these words. Say, Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart and into my life right now. Forgive me for all the sins and all the mistakes I have made in life. May your Holy Spirit cleanse me of all the evil, of all the pain that is in my life. I surrender myself to you completely, God, right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, God heard your prayer, and God's going to touch your life. And just let's keep our heads bowed just a little longer. I sense the Holy Spirit wanting to do something else. Maybe you know the Lord. Maybe you're living with God. Maybe you're right with God. But you know, there's some things in your life that are not quite square. Maybe you're bending a few rules. Maybe you are a little dishonest. Maybe you're not working when the boss isn't watching. Maybe you have been doing some things that aren't quite right, and you know that. And The Holy Spirit's convicting you right now. Why don't you just give it to God like Jabez and pray, Oh, God, let me commit no evil that I can be a person of integrity. We don't have to surrender to our circumstances. Jabez had a very bad life. He had a very difficult life. But in spite of that, he chose to become an honorable person. He didn't want to turn out like his mom turned out. He didn't want to turn out like others turned out, but he wanted to be like God wanted him to be. So I want you to just consider praying this prayer with me. Say these words, Heavenly Father, Right now, help me to be an honest person, a person of honor, a person of integrity, that I might be righteous, even as you are righteous, O God. Help me to be a person that is weighty in the sense of goodness. Let other people see me as a righteous person, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to continue right on now with our service. I want to so thank for those who are watching us online. I appreciate you following us. If you'll follow us either on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook and, and like us there and write a little comment where you're watching from. Send, send me a little message. I, I try to read all those. And I just appreciate each and every one of you. And I'm excited to be back in church. I'm excited. Uh, to be worshiping God, and we're going to stand in the gap during this time. We're going to stand in the gap, and we're going to be men and women of God, and we're going to rise up. It's time for the church to rise up. One of the things that had a significant impact in my life about this whole time, and whether to reopen the church or not to reopen the church, I, I read a lot about great men and women of God of old, and I was reading about Charles Spurgeon. They called him the Prince of Preachers. He had the largest church in the world, 
it was in London era, London uh, in England. And there came a terrible epidemic that swept through London. There would be hundreds of thousands of people die from a cholera outbreak. They were dying for almost two years. It, this went on, people were dying consistently and it was spread from person to person. It was a very dangerous time. And uh, in his writings, it, it's, it's spoken of how he was working seven days a week doing funerals. He was doing a funeral every other day. He was doing funerals because so many people were dying. And it would have been a time that he could have retreated and gone someplace and just got away from it all. But he decided, no, my calling is to minister to people, get people saved and give them hope during this time of crisis. That is my job. That is our job. It's time for us to rise up, church, as mighty men and women of God, as the soldiers of the cross, and begin to do something for God. Yes, this coronavirus is very serious. Yes, lots of people are going to die yet. I don't know when it's going to go away. I have no idea why it's going on. But why people are getting this doesn't matter. What matters is how we respond. And our, our response is not to hide away, but our response is the church to rise up. There's people you come in contact with every single day that need to hear a word of hope, that need a prayer. They're frightened. They're uncertain about the times. And this is not a time for us to spread more fear with all kinds of conspiracies. Let's don't do that. Let's spread hope that God's a mighty God. He's a good God. He's a loving God because that's what we're called to do. God bless you. Love you all so much. And I'll see you next Sunday.